welcome to Second Take, the show that takes a look at the issues behind the news. ESCOM NERSA and the electricity system are under the spotlight this week, with a tussle over tariffs, the return of the load shedding threat, and with Cabinet considering the Integrated Resources Plan. Terence Creamer joins me to discuss these developments. Hi Terence. Hi Chanel. Firstly, ESCOM has confirmed that it will be taking another NERSA determination on legal review. Yes, uh, this wasn't really unexpected. It just took longer than we thought because it, uh, NERSA took about 200 days plus to publish its reasons for decisions for the MYPD4 determination, which is the, the period we're currently in, the three-year period. Uh, that, was, that determination was made earlier this year, and Eskom immediately highlighted that it would left them with about 100 billion, 102 billion r rand hole over the three-year horizon, and they would be applying their mind very carefully to what the reasons for decision were and could take this on legal review. Now they, they've announced that they are taking it on legal review and it's going to be interesting now to see how the courts handle this matter. These are the first reviews that F Eskim has implemented. Uh, so there's, there was the one-year determination and a couple of uh, re uh, regulatory clearing account determination and now this three-year determination, MIPD4, that all need to be reviewed by the courts. And Eskom is not only for these asking for these to be set aside and to be remitted back to NERSA for reconsideration, but is also asking for interim relief, uh, which is going to have implications, I suppose, for us as consumers. So there'll be a lot of attention paid when this, uh, this review um, actually comes before the courts and the outcome of that and what implications it's going to have for the tariff but it is a more assertive uh, approach from the national utility who continues to claim that um, NERSA is not applying its methodology correctly and that we are not in a stage of cost-reflective tariffs. On the other hand, we've got society very unhappy with the, the surge in tariffs over the last decade and there's an affordability crisis. As we can see, I think most evident of, uh, evidence of that affordability crisis has been the, the decline in industrial demand over the last uh, decade as prices have surged and these really serious now um, at, at backlogs in payment for, munis uh, for Eskom services. Obviously um, e um, Soweto being the largest one around 20 billion and now a whole lot of municipalities that are not, have not paid which uh, adds another about 20 billion or so. So we've got this huge Eskom debt overhang which is linked, I think, to the tariffs. Could Eskom saying that the that the methodology is not being applied correctly, and they're getting, uh, they are being forced to undercharge, uh, and you've got the the regulator that's uh, that seems, I think, in this case, there's a particular unhappiness around the treatment of the the bailout money that's been a, that's been a promised by the national treasury and how that's been treated uh, by NERSA, uh, which has left this gap. And now it's going to be up to the courts to decide. And we already got some precedent with the Constitutional Court earlier in the year, you know, sending back uh, nurses' gas price methodology for reconsideration. So even the courts um, are getting involved in these very technical regulatory matters. And it is very technical, and it is going to be very difficult for the courts to, to reach uh, determination. But I think we have to sort this out. Uh, given uh, that we're not in a very sustainable p position at Eskom um, and that we have to sort out whether the, 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 the price setting method and NERSA is playing a, a role in that unsustainability. This comes as the spectre of load shedding returns, which has many drawing a link. Is this fair? Well, I think the immediate Twitter reaction is oh, Eskom wants higher prices, now we must all suffer. For, uh, in the form of uh, power cuts, and this is how they flex their muscle every time they want a, power, uh, a tariff hike. I don't think there is a direct link. I think in the public imagination it's easy to draw that link, but I think it's just that uh, over many years now, uh, the ma maintenance backlog around the coal fleet has grown to a point uh, where the energy availability factors coming out of these existing fleet is nowhere near the 80% target, which has now been reduced to a 70% target. It's below that even. So the fleet is not running um, as it should. Um, we haven't built at the rate we should have built. 
uh, and, the, th and the, the build program of Eskom is not only behind, but when the units come in from uh, Madupi and Kusili, they're not operating anywhere near the nameplate capacity that they're supposed to be operating at. And therefore, there's a gap that's emerged. And it's not a gap that you can just close overnight. So we had the February, Mar the, the particularly March, 10 days of consecutive load shedding, where as we enter the summer maintenance season, uh, and there's a problem with the coal fleet. And at that time, there was also a problem with supply from Mozambique because there was a cyclone that event. Uh, these, this confluence of factors combines to a point where Eskom can't meet demand. And therefore, the only way to uh, um, match supply and demand or balance supply and demand during those periods is to load shed the country. So we're in stage two now. And this is going to have a major uh, deleterious effect on our economy once again. We saw that it basically tipped us into recession earlier in the year. And, it, and we've now seen the downgrades from the IMF, from the Reserve Bank, and the World Bank, which are basically saying that our economy is not going to grow at better than 1%. And with population growth above that level, that means we're basically in a, in a recessionary type uh, phase in this country. And unless we can stabilize electricity supply, this is going to be a weight uh, or an albatross around our economic growth uh, forecast going forward. What is the quickest and cheapest way to deal with the threat to South Africa's economy? As I mentioned earlier, there's no quick fix here. This is a chronic problem. Obviously, if Eskom can get its coal fleet operating at, at better energy availability factors, it would help. But that's unlikely because of the maintenance backlog and the fact that over too many years, those plants have been run too hard for too long. Um, really, the, the immediate action that is needed is, is what business is calling for is we need the integrated resource plan uh, approved by cabinet. It's actually outrageous given the crisis that over a year after the integrated draft integrated update was published, we still haven't got an approved plan. Hopefully this week that will happen and we will get the integrated resource plan published. Hopefully it is a sensible plan. I think if the draft is anything to go by, it means that there'll be a lot more renewables bring, being brought into the system. Um, there will be some coal, there will be an extension of Kuburg. But the, really the quickest fix uh, is to get the uh, renewables program, the, the big baseload one, which is round five, but wouldn't have five of the renewable energy power independent power producer procurement program, get that moving again. But obviously that's, that's one or two years before you actually see production from those plants because they are big utility scale. And the other is to bring um, embedded generation into the system far more assertively than we have done with more, with more certainty around getting your license. Or uh, uh, if you're not going to get a license, um, allow NERSA to have a, a greater scope for allowing just pure registration. At the moment, registration applies to anything below one megawatt. I think the view of business, and I think it's going to probably get a lot more um, widespread acceptance, is to raise that uh, registration threshold so where you don't have to license your facility up to as much as 10 megawatts. That is a big decision, and s but I think it's one where I think it's the easiest, ch the quickest, and cheapest uh, for citizens and businesses to st start being allowed to uh, bring in their own generation, mostly through embedded solar PV on the rooftops, but there could also be some scope for probably wind um, uh, in, in, the, in the fairly immediate f future, in the immediate term, to try and alleviate the supply side problems. The, the, the issue here is we have to find a, a just solution for municipalities who rely uh, on, uh, on electricity revenue for, for, for many services. And uh, we have to find a way of remunerating municipalities for the loss of revenue. But we need to move with some decisiveness uh, and move quite assertively to find a way that we can cushion revenues for municipalities. but to start bringing in this low-hanging fruit, which is the embedded generation. And here, there's so much attention, rightfully, on Eskom. 
um, and sorting out the, the structure there, as well as on the utility scale renewables, I think we're missing a huge trick um, in sort of sorting out this embedded generation and finding a way, a win-win solution uh, for uh, the country, for the economy, for obviously residents that uh, that will be in and businesses that will install embedded generation, but also to find a way to cushion the municipalities during that transition. Thank you. That's the second tech show for this week. Thank you for watching and join us again next time for more news analysis. Also, don't forget to listen to the audio version of our engineering news daily email newsletter.